Uh, now it's our pleasure to invite Dr. Shuli Hauer. <coughs> Dr. Shuli Hauer is, <clears throat> used to be a citizen of Montevideo, like me, <laughs> but her Montevideo, many miles away from mine in, in Minnesota, US. Actually, Dr. Shuli Hauer is probably the wisest person regarding the caring of children with severe neurological impairment. She works at the Division of General Pediatrics Boston Children's Hospital and is part of the faculty of the Harvard University. And she's going to give us a surely a um, wonderful lecture, analgesia in children with progressive neurological, metabolic, or chromosomally based condition with impairment of the central nervous system. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, Mercedes. And it's a joy to follow Po Hang, uh, and it's a joy to be here to discuss this topic. Uh, my objectives are to consider the comorbid sources of pain and symptoms in children with severe neurological impairment to then use those considerations to organize drug selection based on symptom clusters, and then also to um, be cognizant of the drug dosing so that we can ensure an adequate trial with each of the drugs that we utilize. So I'm gonna start with the definition of severe neurological impairment developed by John Allen and his wonderful colleagues in Ireland, developed through a Delphi process that indicates children with disorders of the central nervous system who have both significant impairment that is motoric and intellectual, and that they have associated medical complexity. And that this can be due to a range of disorders that can be either static or progressive, but it's a um, persistent problem. We certainly recognize the many challenges in this patient population, including that they have many symptoms. So in this study by Feinstein from uh, the, United, uh, the US and colleagues using the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale, they identified that children with SNI had a median of seven symptoms. And the three most common symptoms that were identified were categorized as irritability, impairment in sleep, and pain. Um, in addition, it's important to point out that um, there were two problems not in, in this symptom assessment scale, uh, specifically spasticity and dystonia, that obviously can occur in this group of children and can generate symptoms. And then finally, they also identified that poly uh, medication use was very common, with three quarters of the children on uh, 10 or more medications. Given that the top three problems that were identified in that study included irritability and pain, I want to start with terms and definitions and consider that agitation and irritability are descriptive terms that tell us that the child is in an unsettled state of arousal. Uh, and then there's really a finite number of categories that would be considered as to why the child is, is presenting that way to a parent or to a clinician. Um, so for the parents, it's often that journey of trying to understand the features and when is it the child's features are indicating an unmet need such as a need to be repositioned. Or it could be that uh, the child has an unmet emotional need such as a desire for more activity because they're bored. Uh, and then certainly there are the medical problems to consider, acute medical illness, acute drug toxicity, as well as acute and chronic pain. I want to offer up a proposed definition and then use that as a strategy so that we can make, um, kind of have an organized process for drug selection when we have many to consider. So my proposed term is neuropain, and my proposed definition that this is indicating or due to chronic neuropathic pain sources in children who meet the definition of SNI. Uh, but these are sources without diagnostic criteria or tests and without distinct features to differentiate one from another. The problems include central neuropathic pain due to alterations in the thalamus. It includes uh, alterations in the hypothalamus and other areas of the CNS that uh, regulate autonomic function with resulting autonomic um, dysfunction. And it can also be uh, 
visceral hyperalgesia due to sensitization of the visceral afferents that generate and send pain signals. Uh, when you look at all three of those categories, um, all three generate pain and discomfort. In addition, all three generate pain that's localized to the GI tract, so there, there's a lot of overlap in features. And that's okay because the management approach, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, is similar. In addition, such children obviously also have neural problems, uh, commonly are at risk for them, including spasticity, dystonia, and seizures. Uh, and I categorize these as ones that can be identified more readily because they have clear criteria or tests to identify them. This construct is intended to be consistent with the International Association Study for Pain in terms of looking at definition of chronic pain and pain categories such as neuropathic. And it's also intended to be a guideline for the language we use with parents because our care for the child is only as good as how we communicate information to parents. And so it lends itself that we can acknowledge that there are problems that can create tissue injury and, uh, and tissue inflammation that generate an unexpected pain signal to alert us to a problem to identify and treat. And then the treatment will result in the resolution of pain. In contrast, pain generated by the alteration in the nervous system uh, can be modified with interventions, though we cannot eliminate the source, so our goal is to modify the, and reduce the pain that's generated. And though there are no tests or criteria at this time, again, I want to offer up criteria for consideration and for further testing. Um, and the criteria that I have is that we identify children who meet the definition of SNI, that we identify by history that they continue to have recurrent events that include be pain behaviors, and that those events recur for several months or are anticipated to continue to recur, and that we have either no source to, to indicate why or there's no consistent source. And this is a particularly important, given that for some children, sometimes they'll have a source, such as a urinary tract infection, and then other sources might be attributed to the underlying spasticity, as an example, um, and yet spasticity might be treated and events continue to recur and include pain behaviors. And then finally, one other area of, catalog, of um, criteria is that they also have one or more of the following that I've listed here that are essentially the features we know to be observed uh, and associated with these uh, neuro uh, pain sources. Once we categorize that child, um, that criteria is intended to really drive us to say, um, we've reached a threshold to initiate our first or our second medication trial directed at neural pain sources. We have some information as to safety and efficacy about medication selection, and then we can use, again, polysymptom or, and um, the neural problems to guide selection along the way. In terms of neural pain management, gabapentinoids are often the first line given their known safety, their um, efficacy for neuropathic pain sources, including autonomic dysfunction and visceral hyperalgesia, um, as well as the association of impaired sleep in many, and so the higher dose used at nighttime. Clonidine can be a next example, particularly in children uh, who have um, coexisting spasticity or dystonia, and then again, knowing its efficacy for autonomic dysfunction, and then a higher dose at night for sleep. Tricyclic antidepressants, obviously uh, beneficial for neuropathic pain um, and visceral hyperalgesia. And then the um, benefit of a one-time daily dose uh, and the ease of use, as well as benefit for sleep. And then finally, methadone, knowing its benefit for uh, neuropathic pain, um, knowing that it's the one long-acting opioid form that can be given enterally in the children with G-tubes. Uh, and then it's theoretical benefit for dyspnea given its mu receptor property, which can be important for this group of children if a child has recurrent frequent respiratory illness with the associated respiratory distress. 
So again, coming back to then this um, construct that really it lends itself so that we're always considering the no neuro problems, the treatment for it, and looking to see through history, do there continue to be recurrent events that include pain behavior features? And then also recognizing that pain behaviors in this group of children include muscle spasms in increase in movement. And so when they continue to return, that can be a time to, to then initiate a medication directed at neuropain. And then when we're looking for added improvement in symptom management of neuro problems and neuro pain sources, then we can factor in other um, contributing problems such as sleep and dyspnea into selection and into dosing uh, and into second or third medication trials. The next part is that um, given that these problems are without cure, and knowing the adult data that adults who have central neuropathic pain that more than half will be on two or more drugs, we obviously have to anticipate that some children will benefit from two medications with two different mechanisms of action. Yet, we also want to be mindful to not contribute to that polypharmacy. And so always having a very methodical approach before the second or third medication trial that's being considered. And I'm going to go through um, three, the first three on this list. So we always start with our basic comprehensive assessment of going back to history, exam, diagnostic testing. And history includes uh, asking if there's been any medication added in the past several months or a dose increase so that we can consider drug toxicity given that um, the problem, some of the drug toxicity has the same symptom features that we would see with neuropain. Uh, I just happened to choose to highlight anticholinergic, recognizing that there are many medications that include an anticholinergic effect, um, and over time it can be additive and be a contributing factor. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we do know that children tolerate anticholinergic medications much better than elderly adults, where we have most of the uh, information from. Uh, and then I just wanted to highlight some of the more common medications uh, that are used in this population that have moderate to severe anticholinergic effect. Next, given that these are problems without cure in this, again, methodical process before adding another medication, um, there are two considerations that I always have. One is how frequent are events um, so that I can think with a parent, do we actually have adequate symptom management? Am I, given that I can't eliminate all episodes from occurring? So my general rule of thumb is if on average there's th less than three episodes per week and each episode responds well to the a uh, breakthrough symptom plan that includes a lot of non-pharmacologic strategies, we might then decide together that that's actually uh, most days and hours the child is uh, happy and enjoying activities. Um, and also that they're not too sedated, so awake and alert during the day, but sleeping well at nighttime. And I also say on average because um, symptoms fluctuate in children where it's being generated by the nervous system, and so there can be one week with a high increase and then several weeks where it decreases significantly or there are none at all. So it's very important to take a long-term view of things, not just week by week or day by day. And then the one other thing for consideration gets at the, that theme of listening. So for parents, what they describe as distress in their child, we certainly recognize sometimes can reflect the internal distress the parent is experiencing about their child's condition. And so it requires being a, a mindful and listening for and also paying attention to the child to see if, there's, if it's incongruous to what the parent describes and what we see. It's not about doubting the parent. There is distress that exists. It's more a matter of um, where to focus and what to explore. And so sometimes as simple as acknowledging I can't imagine how hard this is when I talk about that I can improve his symptoms, but I can't eliminate the cause of his symptoms. That must be so hard to have to think about. Uh, and it's amazing how sometimes that can just shift the focus of the conversation. Uh, and then showing commitment that 
um, we will think together as to what the best balance is for your child. I do want to spend a little time on drug dosing, and I'm just going to highlight clonidine as an example, because another aspect to avoid polypharmacy is to assure that we're using adequate doses for what is already in use. Um, and I chose clonidine because there is evidence, but there's, I certainly recognize there's worry about its use. So first off, there's evidence about uh, an average dose utilization in children with spasticity and dystonia. And the average dose that's been identified in several studies is 20 micrograms per kilogram per day. Um, if you take that dose and divide it into an enteral dose given every eight hours, that's a dose that's almost seven micrograms per kilogram um, per dose uh, three times a day. Second is um, the worry about hypotension with clonidine, and I really want to consider what's the perceived risk versus the true risk. And I'll use this example of this eight-year-old girl who's in the hospital, and she's on gabapentin um, chronically. At this point in her symptom management, the team does, has made a decision to schedule clonidine and increase the dose. So they utilize her baseline blood pressure to identify a hold order blood pressure so that if that, before a clonidine dose is given, scheduled, then if the blood pressure is lower than that, then it's held. What was realized, it was being held off, and so we were uh, consulted. And one thing I routinely do is look at normative blood pressure data so I have true information. And so what we could then um, just acknowledge is that, understandably, they generated that hold order, but it actually was that her baseline blood pressure was at the 95th percentile routinely, and um, the hold order was at the 50th percentile, so the hold order was actually discontinued. Um, and then the second part to consider is that actually the main risk with clonidine is orthostatic hypotension, so a risk of fall and injury. So that's not a risk in children who are unable to stand independently. But I do want to separate out one uh, group of children who don't have the indications for clonidine, which would then also mean they have higher risk, and that's children who have severe hypotonia and a blood pressure at baseline that is often at or below the 50th percentile. Um, and then it also helps to look at risk uh, with this adult study that just looked retrospectively at a large number of adults who had uh, intentionally overdosed some with another uh, co-ingestion. And the um, median dose that was identified, and I'm sorry, I'm like you, Paul, and I can't read my own, 2,100 micrograms. Um, and so what I did is I used a, a created kind of a, 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 an idea of a, a weight-based median dose. Um, by using the upper uh, weight of 50 kilograms. So this is just to create kind of a, a, a category of, of what dosing was you, would that be equivalent to in children. So that would be 42 micrograms per kilogram. Um, in this retrospective study, there were no deaths, and in the 12 who were intubated, only two were in the clonidine-only group. Uh, and then finally, um, I would say that uh, in both the combination of the evidence and then it, how the evidence has certainly um, impacted me. And one thing that I think is, helps us in making decisions is that baseline blood pressure, um, including that when it's at the 90th percentile or higher, that's indirectly telling us that the autonomic nervous system is stimulated either because of autonomic dysfunction or because of chronic pain stimulating the autonomic nervous system. Um, uh, so that means that a higher starting dose closer to four micrograms per kilogram per dose uh, and a faster titration uh, might be appropriate for some children. And then I, I looked at that because it also becomes important in regions without liquid clonidine so that it increases options at a lower weight for using the, low, the smallest tablet, including half of the 0.1 milligram tablet of clonidine. And then finally, uh, another way to look at it is that clonidine is used for dystonic crisis or status dy dystonicus. So in this one small series of five children um, where there was rapid escalation, the median dose was 7.5 micrograms per kilogram per dose, 
given every three hours, either enterally or intravenously in this region where the study took place. And if you remember, that's, that's almost the same uh, enteral dose every eight hours based on a chronic uh, dose of clonidine. It just happens to be now given more frequently. Um, and in this, there was no worsening in the uh, pediatric early warning scores, and um, there was also, um, uh, remember most of the, kind of, I knew my vision was bad, but I, what's that? Oh, thank you, and so you can tell I can remember most of the study, but not, anyway, so um, it, it um, avoided the need for intensive care admission for infusion, something that had been needed previously. And then the final thing I just wanted to highlight is that um, we can anticipate that such children will have intractable sy symptoms. What I mean by that is a definition of symptoms that continue after two or more medications, which is the similar definition for seizures, you know, another problem due to the altered nervous system. It still might be adequate symptom control, but what I wanted to highlight is several things. The distinction between medications um, that are more established, meaning medications that have been studied in this group of children. We have more information about long-term safety and efficacy. In contrast to medications to consider, but that we have um, not only less experience, but no data on their use, in, in, well, that's not true. Uh, cannabinoids has some been, um, literature, but the role of cannabinoids and ketamine, which has a role uh, but again, it's thinking from the long term, depending on the child's trajectory, given that these are lifelong symptoms, and so children are on these medications for years. Um, obviously, that's different if a child is declining and we have different uh, trajectory and considerations. The second thing is that any problem, whether it's a neuro problem or neuro symptom, uh, the more pro medications in use, the less likely there will be sustained long-term benefit. That doesn't mean that we don't try, but it shifts the focus of our conversations with parents and also, again, exploring goals of care as there's ev uh, evolution of different problems and symptoms over time and what might make best sense. And then finally, um, our analgesia medications are only as good as considering other problems, particularly during decline, that if we don't consider that a child's metabolism has slowly declined over the years, but their feeds have stayed the same, there can reach a threshold where the amount is too great and actually generates symptoms. Um, that can occur earlier in life. Uh, another one is during decline, more interventions are utilized in an attempt to improve the child's health baseline and quality of life outcome, um, but th there can be less benefit over time, and it can shift to a point in time where stimulating interventions such as airway mucus mobilization can be actually too distressing for the child. And so um, if those aren't considered, medications won't be very effective in that s uh, circumstance, and the flip side is you might not see benefit until these interventions are tried. So in summary, I hope that uh, this kind of framework is helpful by identifying and considering neuro pain as a category, uh, neuro problems that we can identify, comorbid symptoms such as uh, sleep and dyspnea, and then use that to then uh, create symptom clusters in our decisions about management, and, and, and obviously clarity as to what goal are we looking to accomplish. That we're aware of drug dosing guidelines that are safe so that we can um, uh, maximize a dose before adding a medication, and then uh, consider where the parent's at and consider the trajectory of the child um, in our approach to care at different points in the child's trajectory. So thank you so much.